We've come to a particularly well-heeled corner of rural Cheshire, Alderley Edge. If you like Manchester United footballers and stuff, you'll know this area very well. But I've not come here to meet a footballer. I've come here to meet a chap called Tony, who has a beautiful house. And on the grounds of the house, one, two, three buildings dedicated to his love of machines. And I say machines because he's got everything. Race cars, old school British bikes, electric cars, bit of agriculture and everything in between. A really eclectic, lovely mix. So that's why I've come here because this is of course a car cave episode of The Late Break Show. I'm Johnny Smith. Tony, thanks for inviting me over because this is, I think this is perfect car cave territory. When, when you sent me the list of what you had and a, I think a short video of that, I was like, bloody hell, I've got to go here. It's because you've got a very unusual taste. All my cars, the cars I've bought, I've bought over a period of time. And instead of getting a pension, you know, putting lots and lots of money into a pension, I've always thought, I buy cars and I put a deposit down of say 25% and then I buy the rest of the car over three years on the drip. Yeah. But then I get to the end of it and I wouldn't sell the car. Yeah. I'd just go and buy another one. Yeah. And I mean, the first car is the 911. I bought that in 1988, brand new for me and Anthony's. You bought it new? Brand new for wow. me and Anthony's. It's now done 69,000 miles and it's on the button every time. It's been a fabulous car. And then I bought the Willys Jeep in 1999. And then I've just sort of, it's gone from there really. Obviously after the Jeep, I bought the Healy and, and it's just sort of grown from there. And the, every car's different because every car does something different. Yeah. You know, whether it's a hard top, a soft top, yeah. a very fast car, or even a, a Ferguson tractor. I know, well that's, yeah. that's just great here. Yeah. You know, I mean, these are, these, these, these are complete opposite ends of the spectrum, really. You've got the Ginetta, which is super fast. You've got the old Fergie tractor. And you've got uh, uh, Malcolm Campbell's Rolls-Royce. That's Bought Malcolm. brand new by Sir Malcolm Campbell, yeah, in so, 1926. So I know you enjoy the backstory of a lot of this stuff, but let's start with you. Like, what was your first sort of car, motorbike, car memory? Because there are, there are three buildings. We're going to do this building first. Well, it's in the blood. Okay. My father, he loved cars. Yeah. And he had a garage and he used to work on his cars. And he was always com com coming in full of oil and everything else. But he actually used to race stock cars and he actually got the gold top, stock car racing. Okay. Uh, it, going back to about 1956, I think it was. Yeah. So he was really good. And he built one of the first of the stock cars as we know them today. Yeah, uh, it, it sort of starts there. And because my father was always tinkering around in the garage, when I was about 16, 17, well, 16 years old, before I was older to drive, he used to bring cars back to, my, to our house. And we had a, a pit in the house. He used to bring cars back to the house. He could, like transit van, can you just change the clutch on this transit van? So that was, that was it. So it was hands-on? Absolutely hands-on, hands yeah. This is a new building, this one here, isn't yes. it? Yes, I've built this specially to store the cars, but then I ended up with more cars. So then I needed extra storage. So I've got these double ramps, which luckily just fit in perfectly side by side. So it really me means I could get four more cars in. <laughs> that worked out quite well for me, really. Where should, where should we start with the, with the cars in this room? Where should we start? I mean, we could start in the corner with Shake Mac well, Tombs. Well, maybe that's the place to start, <laughs> yeah, yeah. These are a big slab, a big old two-door. I think when these were new, they were like quarter of a million quid. 200,000, yeah. Were they? Yeah, yeah. They, they were the most, one of the most expensive cars in the world when, yeah. they, were, when they were actually built. What a thing, though, with those back, the two-door with those back arches and the... They're, they're just a beautiful car and they're the last of the 
of the Rolls Royce Bentleys as well. I mean, then they brought out the Bentley GTs. Well, that was a different, sort of different company, really. Yeah. Yeah. Bentley had gone one way, Rolls Royce had gone the other way, and yeah. and this was this was the end of the line. But this is the thirty sixth uh, Bentley uh, of Continental R that they made. So it was one of the earlier ones, nineteen ninety two. And it was bought by uh, Sheikh Mohammed Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. And he had it for 21 years, full service history. And I got it, and, and I've got this, the service history from 2005 to when I bought it. But it, it spent £36,000 servicing it every year. And little jobs and all the things that Bentley say, you've got to change this, you've got to change that. And it's still got the phone in, and it, it, I've actually still got his music in it. Uh, really? The, yeah, the cassette. There's a cassette in there <laughs> with uh, Arabic music on. So uh, it's just a lovely. It's a lovely car. It's a lovely car to drive. It goes really well. You put it on sports. It stiffens it up a little bit. It's not. It's not a sports car, but no, uh, it's a, big it's a very set. agile, big, big, heavy car. It weighs about. Three, uh, about three tons, I think it is. So it's a heavy car, uh, and it's very, very long as well. It's about five point three meters long. Yeah, uh, I know that because it didn't, it didn't fit in any trailers other than a friend's six wheeler trailer, which is massive, which he bought for his Batmobile. He's got a Batmobile. Your friend's got a Batmobile. He's got a Batmobile. Yeah, he's not far from here as well. One of the original six Batmobiles, and yeah. he bought this trailer for that, and he needs the Batmobile trailer to fit this in because it's that big. Yeah, strangely ace. enough, yeah. All right, yeah. Uh, before we move on, I'm going to have a quick peek at the yeah. um, at the motor. That's seriously clean. Yeah, seriously I've clean. sort of spent a bit of time going through it, cleaning, get the toothbrush out. Do you see so you, the details? You, you enjoy the you enjoy the the, the fettling. The, yeah, the I I do the cleaning and the tidying and the under sealing and all that all that sort of thing and some of the mechanical work, but. Uh, my mechanic Sean, he uh, he's he's very good at uh, anything goes wrong or whatever. Yeah. And I'm scratching my head, thinking, what the hell? Why that? Why doesn't this work or whatever? And Sean comes along and pushes a button and you know messes around with a wire, and it all starts to work again. <laughs> it's a bit of magic to it, but uh, the other reasons why I wanted to come and see you is because you you've said everything has to be on the button. Absolutely. Yeah. The only one that doesn't work at the moment is the MG. And the MG, the battery's gone flat, and you've got to take the front end off to get the to get the battery. And I'll put a new battery on as soon as the summer starts, and I take decide to take the car out. It's not a big job, yeah. but you just got to get it out and mess around with it. Yeah. Uh, so it's a bit a bit awkward. All the rest are all in perfect perfect running order. That's, that's great. I'm going to shimmy out of here. Next car. I've yeah. never seen so much legroom in the back of a car. It's absolutely massive back there. I think this is a slightly longer wheelbase than normal because normally you've got the doors this size and then the, the, the next door starts there. But this one, you've got a big panel in between. But there is a lot of legroom in the back of this. But this, this was bought new by Malcolm Campbell. And the previous owner, he, he paid what I paid for this, but he spent 40,000 quid on it. Really? So he lost forty thousand pounds. He had it for a few years and spent all his money, make it all nice, and then got then got the money back that he paid for it. Which, and that can happen with classic cars. Yeah. Uh, so you got to be a bit careful how you buy them. And I think I got this at a really good price. I bought it from the Bonhams auction at uh, Goodwood. Did Goodwood you? Revival. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this looks like it's been very well restored. It's been very well restored. Very well looked after. It drives like a dream. You know, it's got all sorts of features. It's got dipping headlights. You've seen the dipping headlights there. So, so you dip, dip, dip the headlights. So that's quite, that's quite interesting. Yeah. And then it doesn't have a thermostat in the engine. So what you have to do is you have to open and close the vents on the, on the radiator. So oh, when, right. when it's really hot, you've got to sort of get them fully, fully open. open. And, uh, Winter. And, 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 that, that, that's, and then it cools right down that much. You've actually got to close it again. Cool. So, yeah, it's, it's got all the bits. So is, did you buy this on a whim, or was this always like a 20s car was always on your radar? No, it was, uh, we were at Goodwood, uh, my sister was there, and uh, the champagne was out. Right, and you <laughs> and went, so, that looks a bit of all right. So, and there was all these lovely cars with Bentleys, you know, these um, 30s Bentley, blower Bentleys and things, yeah. and there was, some, there was a nice V12 Lagonda, there was some really, really nice cars there. And me and Vicky, we saw this car, and we just thought, that's gorgeous. Mm. And then we saw the guide price, so that's ridiculous. Mm. So uh, when, it's, when it came up for auction, we started bidding, that was it. 
So you do use it? Oh yeah. Strangely enough, well, the, you've got the chauffeur's hat. <laughs> because I own the car, three friends have asked me to do uh, their weddings in it. So yeah, yeah, wow. it's quite strange, really. Uh, you know, uh, driving them around in the, you know, taking them to the wedding in the in yeah. the car. Yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of fun. This is a very very different car to the one next door, the little Willis Jeep. Yes, it is. This is 1926. The engine of that. The Go Devil engine, 2.2 litre side valve, was uh, designed in 1927. Wow. So, uh, and the, the reason the Willys won the contract, because uh, Bantam had made a, actually sort of made a better car, but the engine wasn't as good. Right. So they picked the Willys Jeep because the engine was a better engine. Right. And they picked it for the engine. So that, that's the, the importance of that is the fact that it's the engine that, that actually was what made it happen. Yeah. You know, whether the Land Rover people like it or not, the Land Rover is based on that. <laughs> yeah. you know, the engine, yeah. the, tra the way the transverse box is, or the, the way the, the, the box works and every, everything about it, that's what Land Rover did. But what Land Rover did is they put an aluminium body on. Yeah. And they did that because of the shortage of steel. At the, end, at the end of the, the end of the war, but they actually they made those. They made five hundred, just over five hundred thousand. Willys did three hundred and seventy thousand or something, and uh, Ford did one hundred and ninety thousand. Just before the the war finished, when they, when we were sort of halfway into Germany, sort of or go, going towards Germany, they stopped making them because they were got enough, and all the Willys Jeeps that fought in the Second World War in Europe, were already out there several weeks after Normandy. Wow. The D-Day invasions, they had enough Jeeps to, to last them the rest of the war effort. Gosh. Uh, and that's a rebuilt uh, one, uh, rebuilt in Germany in 1952 at Esslingen Army Ordnance Depot. So that's probably many Jeeps. That chassis came over on uh, D-Day and the wheels probably did, the engine probably did, and all the other bits did. <laughs> but I'm not sure how many different Jeeps it, 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 came, it came from. Right. Escort and then Datsun. Right. Escort Mark II, RS2000. That much I know. What I can see, I can see just, you know, there's a little bit of, there's a few little scratches and scars, but... If you have a look around it, there's one or two scratch, scratches and scars. But the reason is, this is the original paint. This car has never been painted. Really? It's completely original. You see a little dint here, you see a little scratch there yeah. that's been touched up and everything else. But the reason I bought this is when I was 21, well, the day after my 21st birthday party, which was a good day, uh, I drove to Thomas Motors in Blackpool and bought a brand new, or picked up my brand new red Did RS2000. Did you really bought a brand new one? The day after my 21st birthday. Yeah. Wow, that yeah. was special. And I had that for two years, and by the time I finished with it, I'd modified the engine, and it was quite a lot more horsepower, and put limited slip diff on it. I used to be able to do donuts and all sorts of things. <laughs> and I, I drove it far too fast, and I drove it sideways far too often, and I loved it. It was the most fun car, probably one of, my, one of the most fun cars I've ever owned. I must say, these are fun cars as well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I've had a lot of fun in that. Well, you've, you've obviously you've kept it this long. You must like it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's that's been a great car, and I have driven that quite hard. And it all—that's uh, the nice thing about the old Porsches. You could thrash them to death, and they'd still keep going. Yeah, yeah. Well, they liked they liked to be stretched to yeah. the limits, and I can't. I'm, 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 I am mechanically sympathetic, as you can see from. Some of the pictures on the walls, you know, the Dubai 24 hour race. I won that in uh, the, the GT4 class yeah. in 2014, came second in 2015. So you have to be mechanically sympathetic with any car you drive, yeah. especially if, if it's a race car, because if you, if you actually give it maximum all the time, the car will not finish 24 hour race. Yeah. So how many miles has this done? This this has done sixty nine, I think sixty nine thousand miles. From it's incredible you. shape. So yeah, this is a completely original. That is a body off rebuild, back to bare shell. Okay. And then the shell was completely rebuilt, and then every part was recon reconditioned, except for the gearbox, uh, reconditioned and and uh, put back together again. Is this a real samurai car? Yes, it is. It's one of the seventy four that uh, Spike Anderson 
did, and basically you'd buy a Datsun 240Z, yeah. which would cost you, well, I don't know how much they were at the time, two and a half thousand pounds a week, and then you spend almost the same amount again. With Spike? Uh, yeah, making it into a Samurai. They, they did all the engine modifications, uh, they upgraded the brakes, they upgraded the suspension, uh, they put all new interior leather seats and everything, and they made a proper job in the paint job. Yeah, a super duper paint job, and they called it the Super Samurai. The Super Samurai, yeah. intentionally um, misspelt. Yes. Well, yeah. apparently, he wasn't allowed to use the proper spelling of Samurai, as in the Samurai Sword, yeah. which is AI on the end. That's right. So he, he, he said, "Oh, don't need the A. Just say Samurai. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave it an I on the end." And it doesn't look Japanese. And the yeah. reason it doesn't look Japanese is because it was designed by a German count who invented the Mont Blanc pen. That is, I did not know that. Yeah. You, you mentioned to me about this Healy. It's a 3000, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So this was the third yeah. classic car Porsche, you bought? Porsche, Jeep, then the Healy. Right. Uh, same again, you know, put the deposit down, buy it over the next three years. And I bought it and mechanically it was knackered, basically. This, yeah. it, the front end was like a pogo stick and uh, so basically, I've, I've had all the mechanicals done. It's got a 190 horsepower engine. This has got has uh, modified suspension brakes. The fuel lines and brake pipes are inside the car. That's a proper fast road car. 190 it, horse? Yeah, it goes really well. Uh, you know, done into the circuit, you can slide it around all the corners sideways. It's just beautiful to drive. And we've already talked about this because yes. I, I love the fact that you've had it since new. Yep. And then the other six cylinder you got up here. We, I mean, you, how could you ignore? How could you ignore that? What a thing! Three liter CSL coupe sports lightweight. Yeah. Uh, they, they they were about three hundred and fifty kilos lighter than the the CS version, and they upgraded the engine, and they did it. BMW did it to beat Ford because all the Ford Capris were winning everything in European touring cars. Yeah. So they bought they built that, but they had to build a thousand of them. So they, they, there's 500 right-hand drives and just over, th uh, just over 500 left-hand drives. But I think there's 20-odd in that Fjord Blue, but my father had one, uh, you know, exactly the same car in Fjord Blue. Really? So when this came up for auction, I just had to buy it, yeah. And wow. that was, that's, it had, first 20 years of its life was full service history. Wow, okay. Yeah, and, and it had been used, so it did about 40,000 miles with the first owner and about 50,000 miles with the second owner. So 90,000 miles, full service history up to 90,000 miles. It's now done about 117,000. But because it's been so well looked after, it's in fabulous condition. All the interior has been well. You can see that car's been well loved all its life, and yep. it's great to drive. They are. And they always start because it's fuel injection. What yeah. a thing. And then the MG at the end. MG, that's a Tickford, MG TA Tickford. So it's 1939, so it's, it's pretty old, uh, pre-war. That's the Tickford body, which is, they made 240 Tickfords or 242 Tickfords. I don't know how many are left, uh, but that's, I bought it in that condition. All I've done is give it a bit of a polish and yeah, I even got the uh, Mavalita to polish underneath the wheel arches because it's that clean underneath. Is it really good? Oh, yeah, it's unbelievable. It's, it's like a brand new car. What a lovely black paint job. Yeah, it's a special car, this. Uh, this is actually, this is the only Mustang ever built to this specification. Really? It was built for Henry Ford II himself. He was going to come over and have a vacation in the UK. And it's got every extra you can possibly imagine, whether it's adjusted, adjustable steering wheel, steering lock, high back seats, white interior. You know, it's got the big uh, three, three, five, one, five and a half litre uh, uh, Cleveland engine. But I only found out after I bought the car that this actual car, not this model, this actual car was the very first car in the world to be fitted with an intermittent windscreen wiper. An intermittent wiper. Intermittent wiper, <laughs> yeah. That's... Ford stole the design off a university professor and the university professor spent 12 years of his life suing Ford and uh, eventually got compensation for, uh, you know, for, for, for the, because he had six patents on it. Bloody so uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great story and there's a film called Flash of Genius. You've got to watch it. It's a really good film. 
Yeah, special car, this. Very special car. And, well, and I think these are special. The Maserati Merak. I've always fancied one of these, but I guess I'm a bit scared. Yeah, well, it's Italian, for one. Uh, <laughs> we'll you say said much, it, I didn't say we'll it. I not say too much more about that, but... Uh, yeah, as you notice there aren't many Italian cars around here. <laughs> no. no. Uh, yeah, it's, they're a bit more temperamental, I suppose. Uh, but that, to me, that is a very beautiful car. Yeah. Uh, and not as nice as any of the Ferraris of its day, in my book. Yeah. But they brought a load of those into this country and they couldn't sell them. Right. Yeah, well, they were, you know, like, what do we do? It's this car, this beautiful car that people didn't want to buy. How bizarre. And, and now they don't bring any... You know, the prices, they don't bring the prices up that the, Ferrari, uh, the Ferraris do. No. And there's no real reason for it, because they are a very nice car. They're fabulous to drive. They look good. They, they make a nice noise. They're everything you want a, a, an Italian car to do. But right. that car's, that car's uh, it was in, it's from the States, and it was in a museum for 17 years. And it's now done 30,000 miles from you. Is it so it's a very, very, very low mileage car. A really nice Italian classic. That's the car to buy. No yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, I do like them. Do you like them, viewers? Let me know in the comments, because I think this is one of the coolest Italian cars of this era. Anyway, MG, not Italian. Now, even a lot of car enthusiasts probably have not seen or remembered the MGSV. Is that what it was, the MGSV? Is that what it was called? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, X-Power. Right, MGX Power SV, uh, and they did an SVR as well. The SVR had a five-liter engine. This is a four-point-six. Yeah, uh, most of them were four-point-six. They, they, they didn't do too many of the five-liter ones. Um, basically, other than that, exactly the same car. Uh, this they were about three hundred three hundred and fifty horsepower or thereabouts. Uh, this one has got a Kenny Bell supercharger with intercooler on it, so this is five hundred and fifteen horsepower. <laughs> it's also got bigger Brembo GT3 uh, race brakes on it, so it's got the stopping power to go with the the extra engine power. But this is a seriously quick car, and it drives fabulously. Does it? Well balanced car, yeah. It's 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 it's, it's, it's got the configuration of a front wheel drive, sorry, a front engined. A race car, right? Uh, even the even the really? roll cage on the A pillar is FIA. Because this, this this they were still making these when MG went bust. Yeah, they only made eighty. Is it they went, that... eighty went bust? And I think they went bust because the whole car's made of carbon fiber. Yeah, and they're yeah. shipping the car all around the world. They were they were making the carbon fiber was made here, and then it was sent over to Italy, and then there was, then it was flown back to the UK, and it was just ridiculous <laughs> the, the process. It was a thousand mile. Production line. Bloody it was hell. ridiculous. What a rare groove. I remember when I saw the list and you said you had one of these, I'm like, you are a serious car yeah. person. Yeah. Not everyone's cup of tea. I think it's a I think it's a very nice looking car. Very it's it's a proper, you know, too fast, too furious looking car, really. <laughs> yeah. It's got the sharp fins down the side, you know. Look it, at the it, arches. Everything, it, everything's right, massive big arches and it's and it's lovely, nice seats inside, proper Recaro type. Yeah, you know, bucketed seats, but it has Renault Clio headlights. Are they Clio? Renault Clio. It's you not... wouldn't know the Renault Clio, but they're Renault Clio. No, I didn't know they were yeah, Renault yeah, Clio. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the good thing is, if you ever smash smash the headlights, you can get ready. You can get them ready replacements. Yeah. There we go. X Power right next to the Samurai. This is and this is room one, right by the door. First car I saw, Ginetta again. A rare groove car, just like this. Seldom seen, seldom known about. Why? The probably the rarest modern car of today. Uh, 2012 car. They made the pre-production prototypes. And there's about two or three of those, uh, and they're owned by Ginetta. They're still at the Ginetta factory. I know the owner, Lawrence Tomlinson, a good friend of mine. And I was on holiday with, we're going on holiday with Lawrence, we're going skiing holiday, and I, and I said, I want to buy the first one. And he said, no, you can't buy the first Ginetta G60. Uh, he said, there'll be problems with it. I said, well, that's why you need to sell it to me. Anyway, to be honest, very, <laughs> I, you know, I bought the car off him and very few problems, a few minor things, yeah. you know, that, that, that we needed to address, but nothing major at all. And... My partner, Vicky, she drove this as her everyday car for two years. 
Really? Yeah, yeah. It's done twenty odd thousand miles now, and she she goes you know, to the shops in it, everything. And the only problem is when you open the door, the doors are very long. Oh yeah. Uh, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to get in and out. But but what a car! It's got the race engine out of the race car, but with a milder cam in it. So it's about three hundred and sixty horsepower. It weighs a thousand kilos. It's fully carbon fiber. It's got proper race brakes that they put on the race cars. You know. Uh, and that is an awesome car to drive. It's fly, it's not fly by wire. It's fly by the seat of your pants. Oh, is it? Oh, absolutely. There's no traction control and no ABS brakes. So, uh, so it's you've so it's got to drive it. It's a proper driver's car, but okay. great fun to drive and very well balanced as well. Wow, what what a, an eclectic bunch! And this is this is room one. Let's go yeah. to room two and three. So what, what do you call this place, Tony? This is well. This is the working garage. Uh, this is where we do all the work on the cars. <laughs> we 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 have to reference the BMW Z8 because actually I'm going to do a separate episode um, on this car because Tony's going to let me take it out. I've never driven one before. It's a very very unusual, fascinating, quite misunderstood car, I think. So I can't wait to take that out for a drive, but um, you'll have to wait for that. Or if it's already out, I'll put a link above my head. The Mini is absolutely delightful. Delightful. It looks mint. Uh, I bought that done, to be okay. honest. I've done nothing other than give it a bit more, bit more of a polish. A couple of little, little bits, a uh, few teething problems with it. But that's a full body, just, just like the Datsun, that's a full body off rebuild. This is lovely. But that's, uh, that's as good as it gets, I think, really. Gosh. Yeah, it does. It looks very, very I was that good. impressed with the paint job of this when I... Uh, did, did my e-type I needed a nice paint job I, I took it to the, the, the place so I bought this off I'm not surprised just looking down the sides of it yeah it is amazing XK140 that's obviously having that's your most recent acquisition isn't it yeah recent. this is we're literally just finishing off now we're just putting the back uh, shock absorbers back I've, I've re-undersealed it all we've put new fuel lines in uh, done a load of work around the engine compartment. All the panels around the engine compartment have all been powder coated. Uh, the engine's, you know, been sort of just titled up. It's like brand new, the engine. Uh, but it drives great. So looking forward to going to Italy in it uh, later this year. Mega. Right, let's go to the race car room, I think you call it. Race car garage. Race car garage. Above our heads is a mezzanine floor full of motorbikes. But we haven't got time to, to look at all of them, but we'll put some shots on now. Wow, look at this. So this is the race car room. Yeah, race garage. car garage. Yeah. Uh, the Ford GT is not really a race car, but then it's a derivative of the <sighs> GT40. You've owned this car for a while then? I bought this new in 2006. You bought it new? Yeah, March 2006. It was built at the end of 2005. Yeah. Uh, and then shipped over from the States. Uh, and I'm the first, first and only owner. Uh, it's done about 7,000 miles now. It's been to Le Mans three times, but one time it was in a transporter. Oh, really? It's been to Buckingham Palace as well. A nice, it? nice picture, yeah, yeah. yeah. Went to see the Queen with this car, yeah. What? And they got the uh, mirrors underneath, and they couldn't see anything. It just looks like a, a flat golf ball underneath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, this proper car. Uh, on the Le Mans circuit on the Mulsanne Strait, I've done 180 in it. Have you? Really? Uh, yeah down the Mulsanne Strait a couple of times. Uh, and he does it really well, which is actually, it's actually slightly faster than the Aston Martin V8 Vantage race car when he raced there, that, that same car that I raced at, uh, in the 24-hour 20, uh, series. That one? That one there on the wall. Uh, yeah, it's, that did 174 miles an hour on the Mulsanne Strait. That's with racing brakes and race tyres, and this was either road brakes and road tyres and two people in it. Blimmin' it. So 180 miles an hour. This is a very, very fast car, which is what, what got me into car racing, because I drove this, I thought, this is ridiculous. 0 to 16, 3.3 seconds, 200 miles an hour plus. <coughs> I thought, you, you can't let a normal person drive a car like that. <laughs> you know, no traction control as well. Yeah. So if you hit the accelerator too hard when the tyres are cold, you can have a problem. So I learned to race cars. I started with the little Ginetta G20s, and then I bought a G50, uh, and I had a fast learning curve. I did the G50 for a couple of years, and then 
why don't you do touring cars? So, well, why not? Other than the fact <laughs> I've never, never been on a circuit in a front wheel drive car before. I did touring cars. Really? So the next thing I'm chucked in with the best drivers in the country doing, doing touring cars, which I did for two years. And uh, I was within, the, within a second of the fastest time of the day when I finished, you know, and that's nice. against the top right, top drivers. So I, I, learned, I learned pretty well. And then I did two years in uh, the 24 hour series and I came second uh, in the championship. That's so, amazing. So and that's yeah. all because you bought this new and, and, it, and it scared the hell out of you. Yeah, you thought, basically. Oh, I, I, yeah. Want to, I want to learn how to control yeah. this thing. Yeah, yeah. So this was your touring car? Yes. Toyota Avensis? Correct. This was the first next generation touring car, the one they're all racing today. This was the very first one. Wow. And it's now a simulator. So it's, it's, a, it's a simulator? Yeah, right. it's a simulator. So there's no engine in it anymore? No. Okay. No. It's, uh, you can race this at any circuit in the, in the world pretty well. And it's the same race program that I use when I learned all the circuits to do the 24 hour series. It's funny you've got this because this Boltaco Sherpa is probably my first memory of a motorbike as a kid. It looks mint. Well, that's, that's the original tyres. It's done 432 miles from you. I've, me and Sean, pulled it apart, completely rebuilt it, put it all back together again, wow. and had it signed by two world champions. Gosh. So it's actually signed by the three times world champion on a bull taco, and on the other side is Dougie Lampkin. That's Vesti, and that's Dougie Lampkin. He was something like six or seven times world champion, and his father was a world champion on one of these. On one of these, yeah, yeah. I, remember, I remember him saying. So that's quite a special bike. What a really. cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. Leaning up against your 24-hour endurance race yep. car. Yeah, that's uh, the Ginetta G50. Yeah. But it's not really G50, it's sort of like a G52 and a half, because it's actually halfway between a G50 and G55. Right. The G55, which is the more modern shape, slightly, slightly different shape, uh, it's got the same engine and all the running gear, everything underneath there is a G55, but it's a G50 body because the G50 body is uh, more aer aerodynamic. Oh, really? So, yeah, it okay. gives, you, gives you something like a half a second or a second a lap you know, on, a, on a fast circuit. Right. So, especially when you're doing... But it doesn't have as much aero, so we've... Had, we've up the air, put a bigger wing on the back. There's a Venturi at the back, big splitters on the front. This is a quick car, and we won the Dubai, four of us. Uh, we won the Dubai 24 hour race in this, the first time we went out in it. And then we won the, we came second in the Dubai 24 hour race the year after. So what, in 2014, we won it, 2015, we came second. With trophies to show. Yeah, those are the trophies, yeah. 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 For me, Tony is the perfect car pervert because he has the chance to buy an enormous amount of cars, but actually has really thought through the kind of vehicles he wants and the driving experiences that they will deliver to him. He doesn't just go out and buy a line of brand new Ferraris. I mean, for example, this Beetle that we've hardly even featured, he's going to daily drive this in the summer when he's not driving one of his electric cars like the Taycan or the Jag. Again, really, really fascinating. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Late Break Show. When I drive the BMW Z8 and that video goes out, I'll put it on screen right now. If you don't see it on screen right now, I haven't put it out yet, purely and simply. Why not subscribe if you haven't subscribed already and you'll get a notification when a new video comes out. Maybe you want to become a Patreon uh, or buy some merch and I'll put those links in the description. Thanks for watching.